You're listening to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Welcome to episode 72, the Sergei Bobrovsky or Thomas Shabbat, depending on who you like, episode of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger alongside Frank Saravalli uh, coming to you live from the woodjerseys.com studio. Got the new Seattle Kraken. I have to say, man, I love that jersey. It looks awesome. So uh, think, if you want to get one, the white the ones jerseys. look better. In yeah, person. the white ones are pretty good. So um, you can get those as well. Frank's going with the original six. We're going with the number 32. So pick your poison. You check them all out at woodjerseys.com. They got them all. Frank, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am. Uh, I'm good. Sorry to all of our uh, regulars. We just had some uh, some things to uh, sort out yesterday, but uh, we are good to go. And uh, here's episode 72, and uh, there's lots to talk about. Let's start with with last night, Frank, and uh, the uh, the St. Louis Blues game. I was watching it. I was like, oh, geez, Arizona's giving them a run. It's two to one, and there there's a civic election going on for uh, you know in, in Alberta right now. All the cities and the mayors and everything. And so a few of my friends were running. So I ran upstairs because my wife was calling me to want to see some of the results. I come back down, and suddenly it went from two to one Arizona. To 6-2 St. Louis, the Blues scored five goals in five minutes, and obviously Arizona's terrible because I rewound it, and I was like, whew, that was a bad two-minute sequence for them. So that's one story, but then Pavel Buchnevich decides, like, I don't know what he's thinking, that he's in WWE. Like, that is a blatant headbutt. He got a man, he's out of the game, he's getting suspended for sure. Yeah, I mean, look, you can't headbutt someone in this league, <laughs> and I don't know why or how is this becoming a thing, but... Obviously, you know, going back to Rasmus Anderson on Saturday night in the Battle of Alberta, it wasn't quite a headbutt. And no. although from behind the camera angle looked like it was, it, it, he actually is getting his glove up and punching Yamamoto in the face, which is why he got fined and ducking his head simultaneously because he thought he was going to get one. He explained it that way as well. That's what the video shows. We had Tim Peel do a great breakdown on dailyfaceoff.com, but why is this a thing? It's almost like someone spoke it out into the into existence. All this headbutt talk over the weekend, and here's Buchnevich doing it. Like what I, I don't understand. First off, what are you what are you gaining? What are you doing? You're hitting another man with a helmet on. Like yeah, wh- it's, what are you accomplishing? Yeah, it, like headbutting is it's such a non-hockey, like I don't know, like grew up playing the game and like i never even contemplated headbutting someone like i just i don't punch him in the face dude but headbutting it's just like he's getting you you could punch him in the face with the glove on you get a two minute roughing penalty at at best sometimes you get nothing now he gets a headbutt and i don't know how much damage it did or not but the action itself is going to get him at least a game maybe up to three yeah i'd be surprised if it's more than one um although they may want to send a message but i was actually having this conversation with tim peel on sunday as we were working through the anderson one and one of the things he said was this isn't something that's prevalent in our game it's not you know something that they really pay a lot of attention to or spend a lot of time talking about because it's not something that happens all that often so just an odd circumstance but just kind of an odd night in general with some uh, different officiating calls in the late game. I, like I, I love Matthew Kachuk's athleticism, hopping up on the bench and, and getting that puck. Like he needed full extension to get that puck that was heading out of play. Yeah. And, and he ends up getting the penalty. So here's the thing. So he gets an interference call because you can't play the puck from the bench on purpose like he did. But I thought Calgary was going to get a penalty anyway for uh, shooting out of play. So in theory, though, shouldn't it be two minors? I mean, in theory, it probably should be. And that's a good question that I hadn't thought about. Uh, yeah. and one that I we'll could raise to, to Tim Peel. Yeah. yeah. But uh, either way, I think my favorite part of it was that he went to the box looking kind of incredulous. Like, me? What? Like, what did I do? And it's like, dude. You're on the bench. You can't touch the puck that's in play, <laughs> even if it's heading out of play. Like it's just not okay. No, it was a it was it was a strange night to overall. And what about the uh, the Anaheim Ducks, who have won two of their first three games so far this season? And Frank, how about this? So I don't know how many of our, li- our listeners know, but last season the Anaheim Ducks set the NHL record for the worst power play in history since they track power plays dating back to 1977-1978. The Ducks power play was 8.9%. They scored 11 power play goals all season long. Oh, and they gave up five shorties. So I didn't didn't even know that. 
Yes. Yeah. They were, power- so they were plus three on the year for the power six. Play? Plus six, because they had 11, they gave up five. Oh, I thought you said eight, okay. Yeah, so they gave up five, so they were plus six on the season. So that's, like, that's all, like, that's record-breakingly bad, 8.9%. Through four games this year, they've already got four power play goals. They're four for 11. So if they just, like, think about it. they got four. Yeah. Like, so. I mean, that's why they brought him in. Yeah. Jeff Ward, the assistant coach, they, they actually hired him specifically to retool the power play. Yeah, and it's worked, and and it's they, they've been using two two uh, units pretty much split down the middle, right? You've got Getzlaff and and uh, Drysdale and, and Zegris on one unit, and then you've got Raquel and uh, the other guys um, uh, Shattenkirk and Fowler on the other. And that unit's actually scored three of the four goals so far. But it's interesting to watch the Ducks. Like if you get a power play, Frank, early in the season, you can compete in the NHL. And you've got the Ducks who are two and one, and not a lot of people thought they'd be a good team. Then at the other end, you've got the Montreal Canadiens. They're 0 and three. They got three goals overall. They're 0 11 on the power play. Like th- their inability to score goals. And I w- it's not like they're getting robbed. Like their power play in the opening night, they're five on three. They're the only team in the league that thinks point shots on a five on three are successful. I like they need a power play coach or something because their power play wasn't good last year. It's not very good either this year. Yeah. I, and the Habs are. Everyone had said it. It was the hot, not even hot. It was the standard off-season prediction. It was trendy. It was whatever you want to call it. The Montreal Canadiens are going to be no good this year. Losing Shea Weber, obviously then on the eve of the season, Carey Price steps away. Tough losses. And they're now off to an 0-3 start. And it's, you know, the power play is one thing. Getting blown out in a half-empty building in Buffalo against one of the worst teams in the league, that is, to me was shocking like that to me raised a lot of red flags and and look i know it's three games but how that happens i'm not entirely sure yeah hey kudos to the savers break up the savers early on let's go go sit because let's be honest like most people thought and and they still easily could um you know compete for the bottom but you know i I heard that don granado is a guy who's a good motivator and and we'll see you know but like I still don't think Buffalo is going to compete at the end of the day, but uh, they might not be the uh, the worst team in the NHL, which is you know interesting because there is a, a gentleman by the name of Shane Wright. For all of those people who who maybe aren't aware of the young prospects, uh, Shane Wright's pretty good. There's lots of people projecting him to be an elite player, and there's yeah. lots on the line this year in the draft lottery. You know who's projecting to be a pretty elite factor in the Shane Wright sweepstakes? That would be uh, Carter Hart. Carter Hutton, excuse me, all, all respect to Carter Hart, who bounced back actually against the Kraken on Monday night. But Carter Hutton, Mike McKenna had some pretty searing comments on him in his 1-32 to goaltending tandem ranking, saying that it didn't look like Carter Hutton's body of work had deserved another chance in this league. He signs in Arizona on that minimum contract, and now twice in three games – the Arizona Coyotes have given up at least seven goals in a game. Yeah, well, I that, mean that. Hello, Shane Wright. Like, well, like that's what's going to deliver him for you, or at least no, get huh? get you close, get you twenty percent of the way there. Hey, buddy, they they are not good, and and I you can blame the goaltender, but you just look at how they they built that team to not be competitive this well, year. Well, and right? that's I think that's what's probably most disappointing. I mean, it's it's just a pure tank job, and and to be honest, the Sabers are built the same way. Yeah, I mean, goaltending on out, both teams going with the the league minimum that you could possibly spend in net. And the Sabres and Don Granato, with uh, with at least how good of a job he's done to start, and, and even going back to his last however many games last year, they were actually pretty decent, I think 500 or close to it, that, you know, maybe they play their way out of the sweepstakes. Oh, very. but you know, here's the thing. Just because you finish last doesn't mean you win, right? No, you... and that that is that's so important to point out. But I guess what I'm saying is, wouldn't that be kind of the worst case scenario for Buffalo? Oh yes, if they, if they don't finish in the bottom five, yeah, that would ov- obviously I don't like. Which that's, is hard does to that say. make it a complete failure of a season? Well, I've always like, said like this... far far enough away from the lottery, but also far enough away from the playoffs. It's like no man's land. 
Yeah, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be in purgatory. And I look at Buffalo, it's very early. And, and I've always said this, you can never ask coaches and players to tank. They'll never tank. Management can try to do all they want, but players, when the game's on, they, they're playing for their careers. They're playing for jobs. They're playing for their livelihood. And you know, Don Granato's not going to be like, hey, guys, let's just uh, take the year off. Maybe we can bring in Shane Wright and Owen Power next year, which would be a really good addition. Make no mistake about it. Like That would be a pretty good one-two punch to bring into your organization at the same time. But you know, it's, it's obviously early, and we'll see where they go. But you're you're bang on Frank and and now like that's why I like the lottery some people want to get rid of the lottery I like that they got rid of it so the 13th and the 12th and the 14th uh teams can't win they shouldn't win sometimes they have 91 points right they're very close they shouldn't win the lottery but the the worst team in the league shouldn't be guaranteed it either because uh if you if you want to tank then there's no guarantee you got a 25 percent chance and away you go mm -hmm. and so I liked having the lottery for the bottom five teams I think it's good for the league yeah, I mean, just certain teams that have been bad for a while just have had no luck in it. Like, look at Detroit. I mean, they've been in the mix every year and and haven't won it. So I don't. It's, sometimes it just happens that way. No, it's total. It's like Vancouver. I think three or four years in a row, Vancouver, uh, they dropped spots in the lottery. They were never number one, but they went, I think, from three to five and from four to six and never uh, never really got where they wanted. Now, it is ult ultimately very early, Frank, but I know at the start of the year, we talked about which coaches I thought were on the hot seat. And I, I felt like in Chicago, Jeremy Colleton was on the hot seat because I, I'd heard a lot of the people talking about Chicago's defensive structure is not good. You know, you they brought in the reigning Vesna Trophy winner. Now, I understand that Marc-Andre Fleury, you know what, in Pittsburgh, the first period, he wasn't good. That's totally fair. But if you look at the amount of shots they're giving up, like they brought in Seth Jones, they brought in McCabe, who's a really good defender. Their team to be looks fair, lost. he wasn't good in the first period against Colorado either. He got Johnson no. twice. Yeah, like they back in that Eric. I mean, they they look lost defensively, Frank. And I just when when you make that many changes to your team and the same issues are there, to me it's it's not personnel. Yeah, and I get where you're coming from. My intel and my opinion is that Jeremy Colleton's not on the hot seat. Okay. Um, I think management really likes and believes in, in him and what he's doing. I think the players have been vocally supportive and this is another year in the process. Like as much as I've actually seen it written already to start the year that this is playoffs or bust for Chicago. I don't see it that way at all. Like I, and I don't know I've never heard Stan Bowman or anyone from the Blackhawks organization say that. So I don't know why that would be the case. They're playing in a really tough division, first off, with, I'd say, five bona fide playoff teams, at least on paper, in Winnipeg, Colorado, Minnesota, St. Louis, and Dallas. To be competitive this year, yes. Like, the team needed to take a step forward and get closer after being out of the mix for so long. But playoffs are bust? Like, because why? They traded for Seth Jones? They didn't give up anything to get Marc-Andre Fleury. It was like a, a literal shot in the dark. They might not have even come. So I don't subscribe to that notion at all. And that's why I don't think that there's the same pressure there. And, and to be honest, what, what good would it do to make that change? Like, there still are gaps and personnel deficiencies anyway that prevent them from getting to where they ultimately want to get to. So don't you wait and then make that change when you get closer, if you feel like you need to, I just, I don't know. Personally, I don't see it. I don't know that his job's on the line. Okay. Well, I, to me, when, when there's not any improvement and their defensive structure has been lacking for a few years, regardless of personnel, and then you bring in some significant changes to your back end, and hey, maybe they turn it around in the next seven games and it's moot. So, you know, we'll see, but if this trend continues, something's got to give in Chicago. You, you just made, you just made six significant additions. And I include the return of Jonathan Taves because he didn't play last year. Right. right. So you bring in Johnson, you bring in McCabe, you bring in Jones, you bring in Fleury, like, you know, and they got Kirby doc back. Like they made a lot of significant changes to their team. And, and yeah, early but like, on, so, so go through the changes that you just mentioned. Like, I I'm sorry. Other, like Mark Andre Fleury. Okay. Uh, Kirby Doc, Jonathan, T like, how are those guys helping their defensive structure? Maybe Jonathan Taves is with better defensive zone play, but Seth Jones, like Seth Jones wasn't brought in here to be 
a, you know, a stud defender defender. He he's got other, other things that he brings to the game, including helping with transition. He wasn't, it wasn't defensive zone structure that he was going to totally revamp. Was it, was that well, the no, expectation? No, but it's not, I'm not the players. If you have good players and you don't have the, the good system and how you're supposed to defend as a group, right? Like Jonathan Taves, like this guy was, you telling me that Jonathan Taves can't help. Like if Jonathan Taves isn't in the system he's playing, having success defensively, then I would question the system because this is a guy who for a long time was an excellent two-way player. But who on their defense that you're looking at and you're going, oh, wow, their defensive zone play should be excellent. Like that, I think that's kind of the root of the issue, is it not? Is that, like, I think it is more personnel than anything else. Okay, well, granted it's early, but you you just look at Duncan Keith's numbers and, 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 and how he, and the numbers he showed and what they done and that he's out of Chicago and then look at his numbers, mm-hmm. right? Significantly different. I don't know, did he change that much? Like maybe Jim Playfair, you know, showed him some video of his game in the off season. And I so doubt he's it. Being I mean, reborn. he's 38 years old. Yeah. And so uh, he's not just, changing that much. I'll be, uh, I'll be interested to see if it continues, Frank. I'm just saying Chicago is a team to me to watch because uh, they've been bad defensively for a while. And uh, I, I've been told by a few people that they don't, they opposing players think Chicago's defensive structure is, is very easy to penetrate. So. Okay. Well, something to monitor. I just, I don't know that it's coming down to Jeremy Colleton being on the chopping block this early. Now, I'm um, not on the chopping block, but trying to get in the mix. Steven Stamkos has been very adamant. He wants to play for Team Canada, the Olympics. And when, when you can, this year is unique, Frank, because there was no camp in the summer. I, I think that team is going to be picked a lot, obviously on, you know, reputation, but how mm-hmm. you're playing leading up to it. And, and Steven Stamkos, you know, is on fire early on and looks like a guy who really wants that opportunity to play for the Olympic team. Doesn't, doesn't look like he does. I, we know he does. Tyler and I were in Chicago at the NHL player media tour. And he said exactly this, um, how motivated he was. It's sort of the one thing that's missing from his career. I mean, you think about all that he's accomplished, uh, winning the rocket Richard twice, winning two Stanley cups, um, you know, all those different accomplishments. It's playing for team Canada at the Olympics. That is really missing, you know, 2010, he was just a kid. You know, that was his 19, 20 year old season in the NHL. And then 2014 comes around. He has the injury late, uh, doesn't end up playing. 2018, the NHL doesn't go. And now here we are. It's 2022 soon. And he turns 32 right at the start of the Olympics. So he knows that this is probably his last kick at the can in terms of making an Olympic team and trying to win a gold medal. And he told us point blank that he's going to try and get off to as hot of a start as he can to really, you know, create and make a statement for himself. And so I actually think that's a pretty massive motivating factor for a lot of players to start the year. Like look at Drew Doughty in LA. He, he said something very similar when we were talking to him about the Olympics uh, he wants, you know, and he's been a mainstay for team Canada at the Olympics. Yeah. Now his thing is how can I hang on to my spot? And so I think that's a really interesting factor to start the year is, and it's not just guys in Canada or the Canadian players, it's guys all on a bunch of different teams. You know, don't think that, you know, they asked me about this yesterday on Vancouver radio. Don't think that Connor Garland isn't trying to make team USA and and all these different players are are trying to show themselves the top 50 or the 50 man list that, that these teams can pick from of 50 to 55 NHL players. They had to be submitted last Friday on the 15th. And those players can now are now subject to uh, random drug testing, according to the WADA protocols. Um, so just interesting to note that, you know, some of these guys that may or may not be in the mix, I don't think they're being told, but they may find out, uh, randomly that they're being drug tested for the Olympics starting now, um, you know, leading up to the games. And uh, one interesting storyline on the Olympics, Frank, is the Canadian goaltending. So Carey Price, we'll see where Carey Price is at. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would assume he's a lock to be on that team if he's back and playing. You know, a lot of people felt like Marc-Andre Fleury would be that guy considering he won the uh, Vesna last season. But if Fleury continues to struggle, the Canadian goaltenders you look at, you've got... Tristan Jari, Jordan Binnington, 
You know, Carter Hart, uh, Darcy Kemper. You're what forgetting Mackenzie Blackwood. Mackenzie Black. Well, he's not vaccinated, so I don't think that's going to happen. Well, he he says he will be. And by the way, I actually think that that's his prime motivation here. And uh, not to put any words in his mouth, obviously he's reconsidered. But when you take the the chance of making an Olympic team off the table, well, that adds into the pressure that you're probably feeling with your team. Yeah. Because you're yeah, right. No. You're right out of the mix. Yeah. Well, and then the other guy, the biggest wild card, Frank, Mike Smith. Mike Smith was really good last year. He's on fire through two starts this season. He was also the third goalie. Yeah, I was going to say Olympics he's made it previously in 2014. And you know that they look at experience. And I just you so is Mark if, Andre Fleury, by the way. I think he was a third goalie one year. Yeah. And, um. Well, was he the third goalie in 2010? I think Maybe. he was. Yeah, he might have been. So, but you look at it like it, the the Canadian goaltending one is is wide open. You know, depending on the status of Carey Price, it's wide open. And I know you have Darcy Camper as your as your Vesna nominee. Yeah, he so was think... he was the third goalie in 2010. Marty okay. Brodeur, Marc Andre Fleury, and Roberto and Luongo. Luongo. Yes. Yeah. So you know, it's a it's an interesting one to me. And I just the, the Mike Smith storyline is one to watch because yeah, he played. You know, that's excellent. a really good point. Last just, year. Like an age doesn't matter. It's a three week no. tournament. It's just yeah. who's who's playing best. Who's playing best? And uh, you know, Mike Smith's been excellent. Granted, it's, it's all short, but he he's picked up exactly where he left off. And I liked his attitude. He said, "It's been four months. I didn't age ten years. It's four mm -hmm. month off season." And you know, Kevin Woodley uh, from In Goal Magazine, you know, said they had a lot of goalies guys watching Smith, and he just had four more months to refine the things that he put into his game last year. A lot of core exercising and move, moving. And Woodley's obviously way more technical on the goalie stuff and he talked about how now mike smith what he's doing is he's stepping out on shooters more than he has because he's feeling more comfortable and when you step out on him well now you're taking up more of the net so it's yeah. just something to watch the uh the goal because we all know goalies are so important uh you know at the olympics maybe not so much because you have so many great players in front of you it's not like you need your goalie to stand on his head no but I, I think it's important from a canadian perspective because i think that's the one spot where the americans kind of have a clear advantage at this point is yeah, in well, that and well the russians i think have probably the best trio but you only that's the thing having the best trio of goalies really one. means nothing you right. only need one and they i got think Vasilevsky. connor hellebuck it, how how you know how big of the drop off is there from vasilevsky to hellebuck yeah not what much. are we talking about in save percentage points yeah very very oh, little gosh. very little hey speaking of goalies it's early on but uh grubauer in the crack and not uh, not off to a good start yeah uh shellacked in philly um it's been up, down, all over the place for Seattle to start. I guess maybe that's what you expect for yes. an expansion franchise and one that you know is still a few days away from playing at home. So uh, tough opening trip. There's been some obstacles that they've had to deal with, and you know I don't know. I think they're this is probably somewhat close to at least the first half of the season what we could expect from them. Some really good games, some mediocre games, and some bad games, and um, you know sort of right you know four games in kind of where i thought they might be if that makes any sense yeah no i i totally agree i i see i i wasn't one who was on the seattle bandwagon i didn't i didn't pick them to to make the playoffs you know what I, I think they'll be competitive but i don't think they'll be playoff competitive um you are listening to the uh, dfo rundown and uh thanks to uh, all of you for downloading uh you know our sponsors keep uh, growing and want to thank uh, espn plus because they become a must-have for hockey fans of course listen to the spot you can get access to more than 1,000 out of market nhl games and 75 weekly national games all year plus stream thousands of live events from the best leagues and the biggest tournaments in the world exclusive originals the complete 30 for 30 library premium articles fantasy tools and more with ESPN plus and be sure to sign up now go to ESPN plus.com slash DFO so if you're listening to the pod you want to sign up ESPN plus.com slash DFO then they know you listen to it here and uh, they'll keep sponsoring the show you'll keep getting good content so it's a win-win for all of us um now let's uh welcome in. we got a new segment we're going to unveil on our uh, first pod of the week usually it's on Monday today it's a little bit late we welcome in uh, Tyler Remchuk Ty how you doing I am doing good, you guys. And I was actually, while you uh, guys were going off on your many topics early in the pod, I was looking at our reviews. And there was one I wanted to share. Uh, we got it the other day from Mets1982 on Apple, who said, for a guy with three daughters and much less time and control over the remote to watch hockey highlights, let alone full games, this gives me the fix I need. So he left us five stars. Um, so I wanted to nice. give him a shout out. 
And uh, I don't just want to purely pump us up. We also got one a few months ago titled Yuremchuk from user Tyler is a goof. And it says great podcast until Yuremchuk opens his mouth. So I'm sure he'll be a is big fan. Of, probably. <laughs> Um, so I'm I just sure like be... the guy on there that was like, Hey, I could use a little more Frank and a little less Jason. I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to send this guy a check. <laughs> I'm sure he'll love our new segment. Finish the sentence, fill in the blank boys. I got three lined up here. And, uh, the first one, the team with the most surprising record right now is blank. Frank, I'll let you go first. It has to be the Buffalo Sabres two and oh, like, and again, not even just two and zero, but like blowing out the Montreal Canadiens on home ice to open your season, such a proud franchise and such a proud fan base, like a 16,000 season ticket holder base. Just a few years back, they had 8,000 in the building to open up. Uh, the Sabres ownership was thanking fans that did show up on Twitter, a bizarre scene, but it kind of goes to show the depths that this franchise has fallen to. Uh, I'm going to go with, well, I'm going to say co-winners. The Winnipeg Jets, Frank Stanley Cup champion pick. They're 0-2. They've allowed four goals per game. And the New York Islanders, the Islanders last season led the NHL in five-on-five goals against. They've allowed 10 so far this year in two games. Ridiculous. So the Islanders and the fact that they're leaking goals five-on-five, those would be my two surprises. The next one, and I'll just preface this by saying you can give me a player or a team for this one, but the first trade we see this season will involve blank. Jason, you got any ideas off the top of your head? Wow, the obvious one's Jack Eichel, but I'm not sure when he's going to get traded. So I am going to, hmm, I'm going to say the Tampa Bay Lightning. Now the Kucherov's injured, I think, uh, and it sounds like it might be pretty serious. I'm going to say that the uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning will be the first team to make a trade. I'm going to say the first player traded is Vitaly Krabsov. <laughs> Teams have obviously been calling. He's back in Russia, says he's not coming back over to North America until he finds a new NHL team and one that wants to have him play in the NHL. I'd imagine if not, he'll probably at a certain point try and keep playing and maybe the Rangers will have to acquiesce and acquiesce and allow him to play in Chelyabinsk where he played the last number of years, but he actually wasn't very good there. A uh, little side note, by the way, and I don't know if you guys know, knew this. I, I meant to put it in my story last week when I wrote about Kravtsov. His brother-in-law is Dmitry Samarukov. Hmm. So uh, odd little Edmonton <laughs> connection there. Um, don't know that there's anything to that, but just interesting knowledge and someone will take a chance on him, but I, the Rangers are asking for, you know, something decent back. And I'm like, first off, this guy's shown no ability to play in the NHL. If he did, he would have stayed with the team that drafted him. He's also lost the two big supporters that he had in the organization. If that makes any sense, the GM that drafted him and Jeff Gordon, and also the director of European scouting, Nick Bobrov that are both have both been fired. So when you lose that organizational support, I think it makes it even harder for a player to break through, but this is still a top 10 pick from 2018. The Rangers won something for him, but I, I think everyone's kind of seen and see how he plays and also probably more importantly, how he acts turning down a demotion to Hartford. So going to be tough, mm -hmm. but he's my guy to fill in the blank. Well, speaking of the Edmonton connection, Frank, I wonder if Chris Jury pulls a page out of Ken Holland's book. Remember when they just let Yessa Poliarvi go to Finland for a year, regain his confidence, and look at him now. And, you know, he was a top five pick from 2016. You just Good wonder point. if sometimes playing the patient game might be better. Yeah, but I don't know. If I, if I were running an organization, which obviously no one would trust me enough to do, I'd try and wash my hands of that. I don't want any negativity and even if it means trading it for pennies on the dollar i know that that's probably not smart asset management you're no. not going to dictate terms to us when you're a 20 or 21 year old kid we're going to tell you where to play and when fair enough handful of teams this year are off to zero and two or in some cases zero and three starts you got the islanders at zero and two habs are zero and three and then four teams in the central are, are zero and two you get chicago arizona nashville and Winnipeg, I know a couple of them have OT losses in there. But the reason I rattled all those off, the first 0-2 team that will get back to 500 on the season is blank. Frank, what are you thinking? Who are you most confident in? 
gotta go with my cup pick winnipeg right like they got like <laughs> first off i think their schedule gets significantly easier if i'm not mistaken or at least it should it, i mean it wasn't tough to start with anaheim san jose on the road but um i don't know this this minnesota game is tough but then they've got anaheim nashville anaheim la san jose like you got to be able to pick up a few wins there uh, I, I will take the Islanders. They play Chicago and Columbus their next two games. And so they, you think they'll after, be right there that quick. Yeah. After, after giving up 10, five on five goals. Cause that's what the, I like, that's their whole aura. <laughs> that's everything they're about. So, you know, they'll be pissed. Fair enough. Good on you guys as well. You don't know the questions, but you had those schedules right out in front of you. You guys were more prepared than I Just thought you'd be magic of the internet. Uh, fill in the blank is brought to you by DoorDash, proud sponsor of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Restaurants and more delivered right to your door. Use the promo code RUNDOWNDD. If you're a first time user of the app, you get 25% off and no delivery fees. Thanks, Ty. Uh, Frank, I want to quickly go back to the Kratzoff because it's interesting, you know, because I remember I talked to Ken Holland numerous times about it. And Ken Holland says, you know what? I'm not going to let him, because he has to pull your RV, if you recall, he had, his agent had said at the time, it wasn't him personally, as he spoke through his agent that, you know what, I, I want to, I want a, a new start and go somewhere else. And, and Ken Holland, now granted, Ken Holland wasn't the GM. Similar that, well, that, to, that's what I was going to say. The one big difference between these two situations is Ken Holland wasn't the GM when it fell apart. And so it's a lot easier to be the guy that puts it all back together when you can just say, hey, look, I don't know what happened here in the past, but this is how we're going to do things in the future. And we'd love to have you back. Yeah, now but this Drew, is falling apart under Chris Drury's watch. Yeah, but he's what has he been on the job for like four months? It, it doesn't. I don't think it matters. The point being, there's not going to be a regime change most likely now that Chris Drury yeah. has this big new shiny deal that also includes him being team president, and by some accounts makes him the highest paid general manager in the league. He ain't going anywhere. No, no, I agree. So, that I don't like. Is he? How does how does the situation work itself back together? Well, I think he could be like Holland and just say, hey, you know what, kid? You can go play over there. You can get your confidence. And and like anything, Frank, we think back to when we're 20, right? Like we're pretty emotional. Oh, heck, we're probably still emotional in our 30s and 40s. But usually we calm down and you can you can see the bigger picture. Kratzoff's a young guy. He's fired up. He's probably got someone in his ear saying, oh, yeah, you're getting screwed over. And all of a sudden he's out of the league for he a also year. also fired his agent, by the way. Yeah. And so there, there it goes. So I just, I think he's... You know, there, there is a sense now that, you know, the young players get frustrated. A lot of people, it's like, if we don't have instant success, it means, oh, it's the worst. And I agree with you. Like, Pugliarvi never turned down a demotion to the AHL because he did go to the AHL in his uh, in his second season. So there it's different scenarios. And and I'm not saying Kratzoff will even be as good as Pugliarvi uh, when he comes back. He was never as highly touted as Pugliarvi was in his draft class. But right. It's, it'll be interesting to see if Chris Jury, like I know Chris Jury is a very methodical, very methodical. He thinks things out. I I don't think he will kind of let them, you know, let them be in the Kratzoff camp dictate this. I think you're right. They might get traded, but I bet you it's going to be on the Rangers timeline, not on Kratzoff's time. Yeah. And that kind of goes to what I was saying is like, if this doesn't materialize, like go park yourself somewhere and enjoy yourself because you <laughs> will hold your rights until you're 27. Yeah. So I get that part of it. I guess my thing was just, this guy has a poor attitude. That's what's yeah. clear. He has elite level hockey IQ and thinking ability. You talk to Artemi Panarin and he'll tell you that he sees, Vitaly Kravtsov sees the game as well as anyone. Part of it is the dig in and do the work. And, and by dig in and do the work, I don't mean training or anything like that i'm talking about on the ice get you know get into the corner dig pucks out do the things required to win that commitment isn't there and he wants the success and the gratification of making an nhl team and being an nhl regular and he's not there yet but when i talk about attitude this started a while ago october 2019 was when he had first refused his demotion to hartford yeah. and now here we are two plus years later and he's saying i'm not doing this again so I always think that in that case, it's on the player. Like no one's here to hand you a spot in the NHL. And it's fantastic that you can play in the KHL, but he wasn't any good there either. And I think that's the real highlight there is when he played in Chelyabinsk, like there was no light it up. This guy is an amazing scorer. Look at him. He's on a path to start him in the NHL. It was kind of like, eh. And by most accounts, the KHL is the third best league in the world. A lot of people have the AHL 
ahead of the KHL, depending on who you talk to. So if you're not lighting it up there, what makes you think you can sit here and, and demand your way out? Yeah, I, you know what the you can go back Josh Hosang, Rob Schramm for all different reasons, highly skilled offensive guys at other levels, but you know it didn't pan out at the National Hockey League for whatever reason. And uh, craps off, it definitely sounds like Frank. I think you're correct that uh, maybe a little bit of an attitude adjustment is something that needs to happen. Now before we we go on the pod, uh, a team that many had uh, picking to win their division, they got early injury issues. Frank in Vegas, Max Pacioretty and Mark Stone. Those are basically their top line wingers. Uh, what do you make of the early injury woes for the Golden Knights? Well, for Pacioretty, it's kind of cut and dry, right? You know, you've got a fracture in your foot. He was seen on crutches wearing a boot. He's out six weeks and that's that, you know, kind of get him back late November-ish around U.S. Thanksgiving. And you're like, okay, that's really tough, especially given how well he played to start and, you know, the goals and all that. But the real concern for me is Mark Stone. And it's not because he's the captain or he's a great player. It's really more the nature of the injury. This is pretty clearly a back injury. I know a lot of people were speculating on different things. Uh, There's no question that it's a back injury. And my question is how chronic is it going to be? You know, back injuries are tricky. You know, you might be fine for a while And then you end up seeing, and I'm told by all accounts on his way off the ice after sustaining the injury, Stone needed significant help just to get to the locker room. Like this was one of those, I don't know if you watched all or nothing, but Nick Foligno in the hallway kind of thing sort of carried in. Backs are just wonky. And so if, if this results in a surgery and then it could be fixed, I don't know what the time frame is. Or is this one of those ones that they just try and, and gut it out and 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 maintain it and, and work through it and all those different things and hope that there's no flare up at a really difficult time in the season? But either way, highly concerning for the Golden Knights and really just a tumultuous week for the franchise in general. The Pacioretty, you know, you had Leonard kind of to start the season, uh, Pacioretty injury, Stone injury. Uh, Manny Viveros, their head coach at the Henderson Silver Knights, takes a leave of absence for, for health reasons. And we send our best wishes and thoughts to him and his family. It's chaos. Yeah. And uh, Manny's, I, I know Manny very well. Uh, I actually exchanged some text message with him and he's doing okay. Um, you know, and uh, we wish him uh, all the best and, and hopefully a, a real speedy recovery in, in what he's battling with right now. So uh, definitely uh, Manny and oh, the whole Viveros family, they're absolute beauties. Uh, they lived in St. Albert for a long time. They actually just uh, up and moved to, to Henderson, you know, made it their full time home. They love it there. So uh, hopefully uh, this uh, rectifies itself very quickly. And uh, Vegas, you know, what's interesting, Frank, in, in Vegas, you know, most people had them in Edmonton battling for that division. And, you know, if the orders can can continue their hot start and, and Vegas maybe wide struggles, open. Yeah, that, that mm-hmm. makes it wide open. Now, spa- staying in the Pacific Division, Evander Kane, a 21-game suspension for basically breaking uh, COVID protocols, uh, the false of fine, uh, a, a vaccine passport, essentially, is what happened with Kane. He gets 21 games. Uh, I, I saw his press release and the Sharks press release, Frank. The first one from Kane was just like, yeah, you know what? I hope to get better and get packed playing hockey. Didn't say with the San Jose Sharks. And then the San Jose Sharks press release came out and said, well, you know what? We're hope we're happy he's getting the right things, but we're very disappointed. Extremely that, uh, disappointed was the quote. He was uh, basically selfish and, and worried about himself. Do you think he's played his last game as a member of the San Jose Sharks? I, I do. And judging just by the comments, and I'd be real interesting to see how the San Jose Sharks respond today now that they're going to be asked about it again. If I'm not mistaken, they are in Ottawa, Montreal, Montreal. So yeah, in Canada, lots of media attention, lots of questions today. And it's not just going to be for Bob Bugner. It's going to be about Evander Kane to everyone. And and almost every response to this point has been, we're only worrying about the guys here. And without saying a whole lot, I think they're kind of saying a lot in that (laughs) we're not talking about this guy ever again. And look, I had reported, it was in the first story I ever wrote on daily face off exactly what the situation was. This is way before any of the allegations had surfaced later in the summer that the sharks players had felt like Evander Kane was persona non grata. 
that they didn't want him back. They've made it clear to management. We can't win with this guy, which to me says so much given how well he played last year. He was their best forward by a country mile. And it was the best season of his career. And they're like, get this guy out of here. So then you add in the gambling accusation. You add in the domestic abuse accusation that was made in court, by the way. And then you add in this fake vaccine card, which could have put everyone and their families at risk. And you, like, how does this guy possibly come back? I guess the, the real question is, how does this play itself out? Is it a, do the Sharks attempt to terminate his contract? This is, he's already resulting in a $1.7 million loss in pay, which is one of the heftiest suspensions ever handed down monetarily in NHL history. And, or is this something that the Sharks simply just decide to send him home and say, you can collect your pay, but we're not, we don't want you around our team. The contract's untradeable. The player is untradeable. And he was long untradeable before the allegations, I think, given what we had known and what I had reported, there was zero chance a team was taking on four years of Evander Kane at 7 million bucks. So I don't know where it, it goes. I just would be very surprised to see him play for the Sharks again. I don't know how you can welcome that guy back in. And I think one important distinction to point out, and I had mentioned this in a couple spaces, is the way that the NHL's press release wrapped up at mentioning the exact, I'll just read it here. I, I have it pulled up. The NHL also announced today that it's concurrent investigation into allegations of domestic abuse made against Kane by his estranged wife, Deanna, quote, could not be substantiated. I'm no lawyer, but understand that could not be substantiated does not mean they were unfounded. Yeah. It does. And I'm not saying he's guilty or he's not guilty. What I'm saying is, Go back to the gambling investigation that happened earlier. His estranged wife had posted those allegations on Instagram. And within 90 minutes, the NHL had announced that they launched an investigation. My understanding is that she did not participate in the NHL's investigation on the gambling front. And that the only way they, that, that they concluded that there was no gambling on hockey was they, they used public and private gambling experts to analyze the games, the odds, and exactly what played out in those games to see if he had any impact. And they all sort of universally concluded no chance, no way, in addition to Vander Kane's own participation in it. But when it comes to this, if the person who alleges that they were abused doesn't participate, and we see this all the time in real life and in the real world in courts and in police stations, if the person who claims that they were abused doesn't participate, well, then it's awful hard to, to, to make a judgment one way or the other. And usually the case ends up getting thrown out. And in this case, that's the distinction that's made is could not be substantiated. Again, doesn't conclude one way or the other. What happened just says could not be substantiated. So I just wanted to make that distinction clear. It's definitely a story that you'll see. I wonder if if we see this go down the path of the LA Kings and Mike Richards, where ultimately, you know, the, the Kings tried to get out of the contract that they went back and, and ended up having to to pay for half, right? And and I'm I just more if, surprised that it hasn't happened already. No, it's a fair fair point. I agree. Like I I think they were waiting for the NHL to see what they would come down with. Now he's got a 21 game suspension. Kane didn't appeal it, so basically he's not denying it. So I think that might be the grounds that they were looking for to take the next step potentially. Honestly, I'm, I'm actually more surprised from the PA's perspective that they're not appealing it just because of the hefty monetary fine that's involved or loss of pay, I guess you should say, that there's really no precedent for this. There's no, like, and it doesn't clearly spell out in, it, all it says, and reading through the protocol yesterday, again, that anyone that skirts the protocol will be dealt with it doesn't give you a, a list of punishments. It doesn't say what the suspensions might be. It's 21 games. It's a quarter of the season too much. I don't, I mean, uh, again, take the person and the player out of it. This could be for anyone. If it was someone else, would they be appealing? I don't know. It's interesting yeah. just to set that kind of precedent. 
Yeah, no, it's very fair. So it'd definitely be a story worth watching. Uh, Frank, it was a fun episode, uh, episode uh, 72 of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger. He's Frank Saravalli. We will talk to you again on Friday. Frank, have an awesome week. You too. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Saravalli and Gregor. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode. Delivered by DoorDash.